um, to not just Jamaica, but to the world, because I am aware that there are some countries with more established disability laws that mm -hmm. might not pay as much attention to the convention and to the international day. But for those of us who work in the field, we do understand how important it is as a day to raise our voices together. Mm -hmm. And so I really want to just welcome everyone for being here. I want to thank UNICEF Jamaica. I was told that they were carrying um, the promotion of today's event on their story on social media. And so I really want to thank them for joining with us once again to ensure that people are getting access to this kind of information and support. Wonderful. Now, we've been having conversations throughout the summit about how you as our participants and persons concerned and connected with the issues around disability can do more to promote what has to happen, needs to happen, and must happen if we are to create a world of inclusion and accessibility. And there are simple things that we can do, like sharing a post or a picture with the caption, my story matters, my child's story matters, inclusion is my right. Mm -hmm. Share it on your Facebook or Instagram page. Um, you can also put it on ours, raising special needs, or you can share it on your pages and tag us at raising special needs with the hashtag, I am raising special needs. We want you to bring your story to the conversation at today's summit. Joining our live stream, for those of you who are already on, you can send a message to your friends to say, here is where I'll be from 5 to 8. Please join me for the conversation. Please be reminded to subscribe, to like, and to share on, your YouTube, on our YouTube channel, Raising Special Needs, and our Instagram and Facebook pages, Raising Special Needs and NEF Jamaica. The more you share and like and share, it's the more that our pages and our channel gets bumped up into an increased viewership. And we all want to have more persons in this conversation about disabilities and increasing abilities. We want you to, in the conversation today, in the chat room, tell us about your day. What did you do? We want to ask you to tag two persons from your, your own social media network to join today's event. We want those of you who are on already to tell us which countries are you from, which country are you from rather. And we want to know if you have been with us for all four days, just give us a little note to say, I've been here four days. This will help us with our collection of data and being able to share the impact impact of this um, summit and all the presentations. So we want to get into the agenda, Christine, for mm -hmm. today. And mm -hmm. today is the Parents' Roundtable. It's mm -hmm. our way of commemorating the 2020 International Day for Persons with Disabilities mm -hmm. and World Disabilities Day. Our four days are culminating with this Parent Expert Roundtable. It will facilitate a deeper exploration of how to apply the strategies, the tools, and the techniques that we have presented in all the conversations from Monday up until now. It also provides a significant opportunity for you in, oh, in your capacity as parent, family, or service provider, or as an advocate or policymaker, or educator, or a community member to begin your journey of telling your story. Earlier today, we invited you to email us to join us by telling your story on our social media pages. Thanks to everyone who participated. Um, you know there is great power in unity, right? So mm -hmm. we thank you for that. I want to share an observation with Christine. She had long told me about the meaning of her son Nathan's name, which is gift from God. Yesterday in the presentation, you spoke about embracing the gift that is your child. That was the theme for yesterday, last evening's um, summit. 
And so in reflecting on your presentation and what I know personally and professionally about yourself, Nathan, and the family and the journey, I have been very present to the gift that Nathan has been not only to you and the family, but the fact that he is now a name that is called in the world. Mm -hmm. And that that foundation is also a name that is being called in the world. His issues arising out of his disability has never been really about Nathan. Mm -hmm. The work and professional contribution that you, Christine, have been making for countries were unlocked by Nathan's gifts. Your advocacy programs, the voice support and services that we in turn have benefited from through this summit this week and through the 14 years of the Nathan E. Banks Foundation's work. Those have been unlocked by Nathan's gift to all of us because if he had not come in the form that he came, well, would any of this have been possible or no. would it have occurred? So it's a way of looking at things and choosing to see the power and the possibility rather than the disability and the challenge. I got some feedback as well that it is the first time that any Jamaican has ever provided such a tremendous global opportunity of empowerment, uniting individuals, parenting, supporting or providing services for people with disabilities around the world in such a powerful way. So it, it's the first time our leadership has occurred in this particular manner around disabilities on a global platform. So we don't want to take this access for granted. We really want to congratulate you um, uplift the Nathan e. Banks Foundation, okay. raising special needs and all our partners, supporters and participants. So I want you for this moment to think about how you came to this experience on Monday. What has changed for you? What are you leaving with, you think, at the end of the four days? And I'd like you to take a moment and share those thoughts, share it on your Facebook page, share it on Instagram, share it with us in the chat so that we can have a record of your thoughts. Your gift, your child is waiting to be unlocked so that he or she too can get on with the business of what they came here to do. Every child born is a child of purpose, promise and destiny. Isn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. Your story has the power to transform life for your child or your loved one. So we support you in doing that. So after feasting for these past four days and being present to the great support and resource we offer through the Nathan E. Banks Foundation and raising special needs, if you have not yet done so, friends, please, right now, please like and subscribe to the channel. So we want you to take a little to do that. Just make sure you do that today. Coming from the self-leadership conversation from Monday, which I led, if you are not here for that, you can watch the recording on the channel YouTube at Raising Special Needs. Now that you've been encouraged and helped, it is your responsibility to encourage and help others, right? Mm -hmm. Please do that. Mm -hmm. So... I'm going to ask you to do three things. Within the coming days, we want you to take responsibility for sharing the summit recordings with at least five people you know who would benefit, whether it's your family, friend, parents of children that you know in your child's class, your teachers, your faith-based organization, all your community. Encourage them to like, subscribe, and share YouTube, our YouTube channel, Raising Special Needs, so others who need this support can benefit. And I want you to be clear about that. We're not doing it necessarily just so we can, you can big us up. We're really doing it because that is how other people gain access. And by others gaining access, we expand the benefits globally. We want you to, when we send you emails, please open them. 
<laughs> I have to laugh because I'm guilty sometimes. I say, okay, I'll get to that tomorrow because I need to do this now. Okay. So when they are sent, we want you to open to learn about our upcoming events or workshops, training, share with your network and help us to spread the word. And the last of the three things, we want you to look out for master classes that are coming in 2021. These will make your heart and your minds expand. So we want to make sure you book your seat. Topics include self-leadership with me, how to tell your story to touch, move, and inspire action with Christine. And I know Christine will also be offering some meet the author events for her new books, how to cope. Parenting a child with special needs. I did not forget it today. <laughs> there it is. And also, I'm just like you, but different. That beautiful children's book um, telling the story about Nathan. So we want to thank, there it is. Christine has it. Thank you so much to those who have already supported. The other thing I wanted to do is I had planned to come on, but I don't like to talk through this thing. But here is my, my mask that says raising special needs. So they will be on our website shortly and you will be able to support the organization by purchasing masks and it's a nice thing for you to buy a few and say can you the organization pass this on to persons with disabilities who may not have been able to purchase for themselves because sometimes you can't afford to have the mask mm -hmm. so let's see how we can help each other in that way so Christine we're here at day four yes so what are we saying so I just want to say what some of the people on the streams are saying. So Kimberly yes. Hanley Bello from St. Kitts and Nevis says, I've been here all four days. Happy to be here. Feel motivated. Yes, Lenore one. says, hi, four days. Um, several other people, Nik Nikita, or Nikata, Nikita Morgan says, I'm from Kingston, Jamaica. I've been here all four days. Wow. Nicola Lloyd, good afternoon, everyone. I'm from Monique, St. Anne, Jamaica. And so those are some of the chats um, that have come up um, so far in terms of what people are saying. All right. So let me tell our um, participants at this time that this special needs a special child virtual parenting summit culminates today and what we have today is a parent expert roundtable this is in observation as we have told you before of the united nations international day for persons with disabilities what we're hoping this roundtable will do is to facilitate a deeper exploration of those uh, strategies and tools that you were shown or told about Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And those experts will be able to probably go in a little deeper in the conversation with you. So we expect that conversation to start at, at around, certainly by 5.30, which is in another few minutes. Our panel will comprise parent advocates, educators, mental health counseling professionals, training and development professionals from Jamaica, Dominica, Barbados, the United States, and representatives from the Jamaica diaspora, which makes, of course, for a very robust discussion. We will have a candid discussion around what we are seeing within our own communities, what's in place and what's missing. The theme for this year, as we've told you, is building back better towards an inclusive, accessible and sustainable post COVID-19 world by, for and with people with disabilities. The significance of this year's theme emphasizes the importance of strengthening collective efforts for universal access to essential services, including immediate health and social protection, education, digital infrastructure, accessible information, employment, and other sociocultural opportunities. People with disabilities are not to be left behind in times of crisis. So we know that during the COVID-19 pandemic, 
persons have experienced isolation, disconnect, disrupted routines, diminished services have greatly impacted the lives and mental well-being of persons with disabilities all around the world. Spreading awareness of invisible disabilities as well as the potential detrimental and sometimes, you know, it's not apparent. The impacts on mental health is crucial as the world continues to fight against the virus. Our panel this afternoon into tonight will be led by Christine and Centre Green, who will do the opening statements. Each panelist is then going to be invited to speak on their specific topic for two minutes. All attendees to the summit inside this Zoom meeting and on the live streams on YouTube at Raising Special Needs and Facebook at Raising Special Needs are asked to put your questions in the chat or dialogue box. We have a wonderful pa panel of volunteers who will see that, read it, and pass it on to those persons who need to answer the question. So we look forward to you saying when you pass on your question, your name and the country that you are from so that we can also honor you in this space. So it's about 20 minutes after five. I'm going to tell you now who the persons are on the panel, and then we are going to invite them to join us in our chat room. So as we build back better towards an inclusive, accessible, and sustainable post-COVID-19 world by, for, and with persons with disabilities, you know, I just have to pause and say, when I say that, I really feel as if the world has been bending or shifting to something that is far more illuminated, powerful and wonderful than we could ever have imagined. And so despite the challenges we've all been facing and experiences, I really feel like we can hold a space for the promise that it is going to be a better world. We have far more difficulties to go through, but there is always the light at the end of the tunnel. Let's keep our eye on that and focus and move towards the light. So I'm going to be inviting Christine Stapley Banks, author, parent advocate, founder of the Nathan e. Banks Foundation, Raising Special Needs and the Parent Summit Jamaica USA to join us as our host for the evening. She's already here. We're going to also ask Centre Green, Inclusion Specialist and founder of Full Circle Consulting Systems, Inc., Summit Partner USA, who will be joining us shortly. We're so happy to have Dr. Karen Donkley, educator and president of the Jamaica Northeast Diaspora USA, who is our partner for the Parenting Summit USA. Lorraine Smith is a licensed associate counselor and certified clinical mental health counselor and member of the Jamaica Northeast Diaspora USA. Sasha Hill joins us as a parent and founder of Super Parent Support Group um, and SEFEH Trading, providers of medical and accessible equipment, Jamaica. Maureen Weber, parent, social economic development and inclusion practitioner. Her work focuses on designing, managing and seeking grant funds or evaluating programs and projects, which focuses on the inclusion of marginalized groups, including youths, persons with disabilities in Jamaica. And our final roundtable participant, Dr. Glenville Liburd, medical consultant and assessor for disability benefit claims with the St. Kitts Nevis Security Scheme, Chair Caribbean Community Based Rehabilitation Network in Nevis. Thank you for joining us. 
And so in light of our conversations today being again, we remind you the 2020 International Day for Persons with Disabilities. Let me remind you again, the theme of our conversation and the theme for the day, we are building back better towards an inclusive, accessible and sustainable post COVID-19 world by, for and with people with disabilities. So our, our So Elaine, mm -hmm. so no, so I gave these these um speakers or panelists follow instructions. I told yes. them do not dial in until just before 5:30. <laughs> ah. So I think but I just wanted us to kick off the conversation um today in or to kick off the panel. Yes. Um, I want to welcome Corrine. Um, Corrine has come back. We have some questions that came in for her that she's going to answer a little bit later on um, in the program. But I also wanted to, um, to kick off with um, just a testimonial. You spoke earlier about um, us coming to a consciousness that our stories matter mm -hmm. and our stories have power. We have been, as parents and families and those working with um, children with, with disabilities and individuals with disabilities, we've been socialized to see the person as a burden and to see the challenges that we miss the gifts. Mm -hmm. And so um, today there was a very enlightening conversation with a medical doctor when she shared with me how um, just the work of the foundation, just the work of reading my book, how the difference that ha that has made for her family personally, as well as she is now lecturing at our university in Jamaica, medical students, and she shared how um, she had pretty much um, now put in a disability awareness class for young doctors who are coming up and the impact it made. And I just wanted to share that for a moment, including as people are um, listening in, they would also see the artwork from young Andre, who is her son, who has cerebral palsy, just turned 13, whose artwork designed the cover of my book and who has just been growing from strength to strength. So I'm gonna ask our producer to just play that right now, please. Hi, I'm Dr. Kian Bukal and I am a practicing medical doctor as well as a lecturer at the University of the West Indies in Jamaica. I just like to use this forum to say thank you to Christine and the Nathan Banks Foundation. Um, through my years of interacting with Christine um, and the foundation, I have learned a lot. Um, also the mother of a child with cerebral palsy and just understanding some of the emotions that we go through as well as um, my own experiences of how a child with a disability is perceived by my own colleagues i decided to um, introduce an awareness of um, managing persons living with disabilities to the medical students that i teach and it's because of the impact of Christine uh, that I thought it was very important to teach the doctors coming up, these young doctors coming up, um, the biopsychosocial model and patient centeredness when it comes to treating a person with disability, whether this, this disability was obtained through an accident or whether or not the child was born and had cerebral palsy. And I did a, this was the first um, year that we're doing this lecture. And I asked the students how aware they were of, you know, some of the challenges being faced by persons living with disability. And a lot of them said they weren't aware of the majority of the challenges and that the lecture really impacted them. I even read a segment of Christine's book to them in the class, um, how to cope parenting a child with special needs, especially the part that talks about how uh, professionals treated parents 
um, of special needs children, you know, the difficult parent and would uh, avoid treating them and, and they were appalled. So just bringing some awareness to them, I, I, I think um, has impacted their outlook. And I pray that it would impact their practice as they go through medical school and continue on in their residency programs. So thank you, Christine and NEF. Hi. Awesome. I'm waiting on you to come in, Christine. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. What 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 I took away was that your book, which I keep on showing to say, you know, we need to purchase this book. It's not just a storybook. It's a resource book. And what Dr. Kayan Buchel has just shared with us is there was enough resource information, technical, because Christine doesn't, doesn't write, she researches. And there was enough information that she could design a course for doctors to be able to better engage with patients with disabilities because so many of them complain about not being well treated when they go to our especially public hospitals. So what can I say? Yeah, yeah, it has been um, you know, quite a journey. And I really thank her for sharing because sometimes um, you do know that your work has power, but to hear it sometimes yeah. and to hear the impact. And that is why we're asking those who are on the stream to share your story, share being here, what that has meant for you, share it um, in your post, just begin to speak because um, that's how you begin to build your voice of advocacy. And that is how you begin to truly that journey of learning mm -hmm. how to truly embrace your child and to embrace all that comes with the child. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And to remind ourselves that great opportunities and great possibilities come with all life. Yes. So there is yes. a power in that. So it's 5.30. Yes. Um, yes. I'm waiting to see who is coming into the room. I, <laughs> I'm not seeing who is so in the room. So we have um, Lorraine Smith. Yes. Uh, we have Glenville Bird just joined. We have Sasha, mm -hmm. uh, who is here, my uh, co-panelist uh, facilitator center. Um, I have not seen her yet, but she did explain that it was a really difficult day for her and um, she would fit in for 5.30. Yes. So we may um, need to start. I'm also looking for Maureen. Um, she did say that her son was not well but mm -hmm. she wanted to be here, especially because her son was not well. She mm -hmm. felt it was important to bring her voice in. So, um, so we have part of the panel, but I think that we should begin. Right. So do you want to kick us off this evening? <clears throat> so you have the questions that- um, Well, the thing right. is, it, it's, it's, it's the- <clears throat> UNESCO is challenging all of us to think about and courageously lean into this issue of standing and being counted in the matter of moving the world after COVID-19 towards a more inclusive, accessible and sustainable standard of life. Mm -hmm. And so we want to ask uh -huh. ourselves, you know, when we hear that word inclusion, what really comes to mind for us? And how do we think we can give life to that word for our children and persons with disabilities? If we look at the broader spectrum of the persons we engage with as parents, school leaders, government officials, community organizers, and service providers, how can we expand and impact all of those persons in this matter of expanding inclusion. So I don't right. know and who wants I'm to happy start. To say, I'm happy to say that Center has just joined us. Yes. Center. Good afternoon, good after morning, uh, good morning and good evening, <laughs> on where you are in the world. I'm happy to be here, hello. Yes, yes. hi Thank Center. You. Okay. So I, I think rather my, my spirit is leaning me to, so we have yourself, we have Center, we have Lorraine, you said, mm -hmm. yes, but I'm not seeing everybody on my screen. So this is right. a challenge I'm having. I'm, 
I'm not I'm picking up everyone who is actually in the room. Right. So there's so, Glenville Bird and there is Sasha. So why am I not seeing him is what I'm asking. Not and sure. why isn't Lorraine and Sasha? So I need to ask Ricardo if he can help me to see who has joined on the panel so that I can engage with them. But perhaps I can start with you ladies who are here as the co-hosts for today. Mm -hmm. I certainly would like, and I'd start, Senta, I know you're just joining, but I know you're ready. You're always <laughs> ready. So I really just looking back at the last um, three days, you know, and the broader back behind you spectrum of your life with a child with disability, this particular event, I was saying to Christine, you know, we were acknowledging that it's the first time coming from south to north that there has been a Jamaican led event of such global engagement in the issue of um, disabilities. And today being World Disability Day, I just wanted to get your own perspective of what are the issues currently that stand for you as issues of concern and also let's not forget issues of celebration issues of celebration issues of concern elaine you are always good at <laughs> setting the tone and creating the charge um well one of the things that i want to begin with is uh, christine knows um and for those of you who are joining us that I've done a lot of deep work in China. And there is a proverb that I wanna share with everyone because I think it's appropriate to what you just asked, Elaine. Mm -hmm. And the proverb goes like this, if there's light in the soul, there will be beauty in the person. Mm -hmm. And if there's beauty in the person, there will be harmony in the home. Wow. If there's harmony in the home, there will be order in the nation. Wow. And if there's order in the nation, there will be peace in the world. Amen. And if there's peace in the world, the invitation is saying it begins with us, yes. right? And with the yes. power of inclusion. Yes. So yes. That, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ask you when you have time to just yes. put that on our page, you know, some in the share, please, because I certainly would like to also have a record of it for my life. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I think it beautifully captures what you're saying. Yes. There it is. There's the challenge and also the opportunity to celebrate. How do we create what we call um, a holistic model, right? That we're yes. keeping the child, the family, the community, and society yes. all in play. That's just, the invitation. We, yes. we just had a request from Jamaica, from Maureen Weber, who is joining us in the panel. She wants you to share it so everybody can see it. So is it possible to pass it on um, to Ricardo, Christine? Or we have to wait until the end of the conversation? We, we wait. And so it okay. will give everybody a reason to subscribe and go back to our page <laughs> to get it. <laughs> That's yes. good. Well, yes, I so, so there it is, there's the invitation, but it's also the challenge because the proverb is asking and calling for everyone to come forward and wrap their hands around what we're calling inclusion. And I think that is the clarion call that UNESCO is putting forward to all of us is mm -hmm. how are we gonna show up and create a sense of membership, a sense of belonging for mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. And depending on our paradigms, our mindsets, depending on our life experiences, depending on cultural taboos. So what have we been taught in our own country and our own land about how to view and perceive disabilities? That becomes a roadblock. So in, in my world travel, humbly, what I have experienced is that mindset is everything. Mm. So you can have systems, you can have all kinds of beautiful uh, programs. You can have schools that look like the Taj Mahal, but if the mindset is not there, it doesn't matter. Wow. Wow. So that, that's what's coming to mind right now in this moment, Elaine, because I, I love what you're saying. There's the challenge and there's also the opportunity to yes. celebrate, right? Yes. And yes. so the first thing that I can offer to all of us, and it's completely free, yes. is the mindset. Yes. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And, you know, I, I don't know if you saw me kind of <laughs> this big smile, 
because one of the conversations that Christine and I have engaged with and practiced with is the conversation about mindset. Um, another way of looking at it is, you know, what's your paradigm? How, how, yes. wh wh where, where are you standing? And it, it, it's something interesting to really be able to call to attention because in our self-leader practice, that is also a core issue. Because no matter what opportunities you have, what talents you have, what gifts you have, if the mindset is saying, I'm not good enough, if the mindset is saying, I'm not worthy, mm -hmm. if the mindset is saying, I'm too tall, my nose too broad, my big toe too big, whatever nonsense we condition our minds to believe about ourselves, whether it's physical, emotional, or mental. As self-leader, our mindset controls and qualifies and sometimes aborts the opportunities that we are given. So I and, thank you for calling us to that. Yeah, and, and just to, to continue in that, that vein, when we talk about mindset, um, we're talking about mindset across all the different players yes. who are involved. We're talking mm -hmm. about, because if I, as a parent, um, have the mindset of seeing the gift and potential in my child, but the teacher right. doesn't, or the doctor doesn't, then it creates that kind of friction. And I always have to remember, it's that one child or one individual who is interrelating with all of these people. And so as parents, we have to, or for me, I have decided that my mindset is what should drive the process for my son. And so I therefore take it as my responsibility, wherever I'm going, I take it as an opportunity to educate and to enlighten and to explain to people that I get it. So even here in the States where you have so many services available, I still have to stand in that space for my son to mm -hmm. say, that I get that these are the general services, but how are we under the law? How are we now specializing or individualizing that service to meet his needs and not yes. the, the needs of a class? Yes. And so it goes back to each of us understanding our responsibility, but if others don't understand theirs, that should not stop us as parents to know ours mm -hmm. and to do the teaching. Yes powerful and true. Yeah. So I am still in the space of a question mark around. Um, I know Lorraine is with us, Lorraine Smith, but I'm not seeing her. So I am not clear if her video is not on. So I want to ask Ricardo if he can check on her. Is Dr. Liebert in the room with us now? Yes. Because I'm not seeing him either. So I'm asking if he could check if his video is on and to unmute his microphone so he can join us. I'm also waiting to see Maureen Weber. Um, I she, she's here. Note. She's okay. here. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm seeing her now. I'm seeing her now. Apparently, I needed to click on something on my Yes, to change screen. your view. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. So we've invited each of you to make an opening statement around this summit, what you have seen, heard, accessed, how you, what has been stimulated for you in the presentations or in the process of the conversations or not relating to any of that, but sharing from your own personal concerns and experiences. So Dr. Liebert, would you like to begin to continue rather? Yes, yeah, certainly a present good evening to you, Elaine. And yes. thanks to you, Christine, for organizing this lovely event and Lorraine and Maureen and others in the room. Yeah, it's been a pleasure to be part of this journey to help build a, an inclusive Caribbean society. And as Maureen will explain, we in the Caribbean have been getting our house organized since the start of the COVID pandemic, you know, we were forced to go into a virtual, virtual connection paradigm mm -hmm. because of lack of travel and so on. And we began a WhatsApp group and we have weekly Zoom meetings. And now we have met many friends, including, including Christine, and we've been having these wonderful collaborative experiences. And this summit, even though I wasn't able to attend most of the event because of other activities, 
I attended the first day and it was very enlightening, especially the session about art as therapy, you know, and of course, what you're just saying about being a self-advocate for your child and knowing what you want and how to navigate the, the maze of services that exist is so important. And, and an empowered parent is, is a child's best, best friend or best help, you know, that, that parent knows the child inside out and know how to link the child with services so that the child himself can become empowered. And so that's the way I want to see us going, that we have an enlightened Caribbean society where parents taking charge of their disabled children and leading them to the maze of professional services and policies that, that exist. So that at the end of the day, they could rest comfortably, comfortably knowing that their child has been well provided for, so that they could go to the other side of life in peace, knowing that they have built a safety net around their child. The child himself has become empowered to look after himself and to advocate for himself. And that's the successful parenting, I think. Thank you. I Thank you, Dr. Liebert. I want to jump across to my friend and old schoolmate, Maureen Weber. As a parent, social economic development and inclusion practice practitioner, uh, Maureen, part of this summit. What are your concerns, especially focusing on today, World Disability Day? You know, Elaine, I'm, again, I'm sorry I joined late, but as I explained, um, it's all my son good. on the toilet seat and for yeah. some reason decided to sit on the toilet seat. Yeah. And therefore, and I know he was testing me because he does that sometimes, yeah. but he has not been well. He has... Um, extreme arthritis in his right side. Mm. And for whatever reason, it flared up. And for a whole day, he couldn't walk. And so Anna and I carried him everywhere. Wow. So that's pretty much been our journey. Yes. Um, and I, I, I'm really sorry, Mr. Sessions, but I have been really caring and focusing on him. And one of the things that we have as parents is trying to divide, wanting to be involved in the empowerment conversations, but dealing with the day-to-day. Um, yeah. Glenville made a point about being able to access resources and services. I don't know what world he's living in, but he knows that I'm going to say this. The problem is that there's nothing, right? Yeah. I have had so many sessions with parents where they start with the elephant in the room. I would wish to die before my child. Hmm. And they say, it, and then they just get a peace because hmm. no parent really wants to bury their child. Mm -hmm. But in the Caribbean, it's people the services. You dread and you fear mm -hmm. what happens afterward because of the absence of services. I think so perhaps the whole issue of inclusion can only happen if we force our governments to be much, much more responsible for the inclusion as well. We keep on saying what a parent should do, what a parent should do. And Christina and myself and parents, we do. But if the system is hostile and not opening up to us, it becomes a double work. I mean, to me, to advocate every day and to come home and have a 28-year-old child who has to clean out and uses the toilet and have energy for myself or my other child. It's significant. Mm -hmm. so somewhere in there, the system has to begin to give. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what I think will be my, my, my opening. Um, there are no means of services. There's really very little services that are available. Um, they had a benefit. Let's use the COVID experience. They had a benefit for COVID, um, for COVID for people with disabilities. Different countries eventually jumped on board. When Anna Kay, because I was still in St. Vincent, applied, they insisted that they needed a bank account for Brian. No, listen to me, people. This person <laughs> can't hold a pencil. This person <sighs> has have, have, have severe health disabilities. They yeah. say you have to have a bank account. Well, you yeah. cannot have a bank account. Mm -hmm. But they still have to declare him mentally off. No, my son has accountability. He's not insane. Mm -hmm. And in fact, quite frankly, he's a lot more sane than some people that I've had encounter. So yeah. the system already has challenged. I mean, in other words, as my starting point, I think the yeah. COVID thing certainly has taught us a lot more about how excluded we are. Right. Yes. Um, it, has, it has really taught us that. I think we take for granted. Brian mm -hmm. gets his solace by going out and interacting. He cannot go out anymore because his sensory issues, he won't wear a mask on his face. Mm -hmm. He can go nowhere now. Mm -hmm. So when I'm driving out of the house or I'm driving out of the house, he goes ballistic and bites his hands to pieces. Because if he, but we are now leaving him out. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it, it, it's, it's the, and then of course, so the, the, so the, the COVID thing has sort of ripped off the bandaid of what is wrong. Mm 
Not and can I, can I jump right in here, um, Maureen? And, and, you know, thank you for being so open and honest and candid because it's, it's nice to sit and, and talk about the, 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 the nice side. But a lot of times the underbelly is there. But one of the, 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 the thought process that I want to offer to this, and, and it was something that from very early put me in a different space, of what to do with the information was that in all of the research that I've done, all of the systems that exist in developed nations, um, whether it's the United States, North America, the majority of the services came out of parent yeah. advocacy. Mm -hmm. And so it didn't start with the government. And so when we sit and we don't articulate, we don't come together I'm not putting blame. I'm saying that we got to begin to, to, to understand, right, that we need to become more target, more focused in, 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 in explaining to the systems that be what it is that you need to do. Because nothing that I do, I push the door, I push the door open, I get on bad and I get on evil. So just to be clear, I'm quite clear that anything now, anywhere we have gotten to. So when they told me that Brian is over 18, so he can't be on my health insurance unless he's in school or he has a job. And I said to Richard, I said, well, I tell you what, give him a job. If you can find a job for my son, fine. Otherwise, put him on my health insurance. Then he said, I'll do it for you. I said, no way. I know you, Richard, so you do it for me. I want you to do it for anybody who comes to the door afterwards. So I'm clear about that. But I think it's important for us to realize that it is a lot of it has to do with government itself. So the, the issue of policy and program, we have to be at that level, at the, at the table, to get the things to happen. Otherwise, we're going to spend a lot more. I mean, Brian is 28. I've been making a noise from when he was two years old. Yeah. And I'm yeah. still making a noise. But I think yeah. we have to understand that the system also is, I feel, like I, I feel like it's pushing back against us. Oh, we can't afford it. We don't have enough money for that. Other children can't get it. So on and so on and so forth. It's always an excuse. I clear about it. Advocacy or nothing for us. Right. So what I think you're looking at, though, is humanity and humanity choosing what it is creating. And I think we are creating out of unconsciousness for a long time. We have been unconscious as governments and as leaders about the impact of our leadership and our lack of leadership. And I, what I think this summit has helped me to appreciate is that if you look at the history of the world, nobody, you're not given anything. And unless there is a consistent, deliberate practice of not just asking, but standing in the space and requiring, whether it's through silence, whether it is with placards, we look at the Black Lives Matter movement, we look at all the various movements on the planet. There is something in how governing and governance has been designed that it is not intentional around meeting the needs of the governed. And that is just the reality of most of the governments on the planet. You may see a difference, say, in countries like Sweden, Switzerland, um, Netherlands, some of those countries that have chosen, chosen a way of administration that is more people-centered. But I think most of the systems we are working with on the planet are politically centered, government centered they are turned into themselves and it's an issue of power and dominance not service so i am seeing that organizations like the nathan e. banks foundation and all of our connected work has to be to push those persons into greater awareness i think there's a huge lack of awareness marine well, they I don't know and they don't care and also there is a perception that, that it, it, is, it is difficult. I, I gave the example of I'm managing a project in St. Vincent. It's about human development and working with youth at risk, youth, uh, excluded youth, mm -hmm. and training them in pretty well technical skills so they can actually get jobs. And I said after the first two cohorts, we need to put people in the training program. Oh, it's impossible. The PS said, you sure we can manage it. The minister said, no, it's impossible. The World Bank will never approve it. And I just pushed and pushed and pushed. And when they came to the first session, a session we had on um, Deaf Day, Awareness Day, you walk into that room, there are three students who are deaf. This is young adults. And there are 12 who are not. 
and you could not tell who was deaf. In fact, there were some of the students who were, were not who were hearing, who had mastered words and sign from being included because, because people were, they were deaf. And they yeah. said to me afterwards, I thought it was impossible. I did not think we could do this. So right. that was like almost a Jamaican who shook the door open. Right. Yeah. So we're yeah. looking to create that world in the future. And I want to bring in Lorraine Smith, who has been patiently present listening as a licensed associate counselor and certified clinical mental health counselor, Lorraine. Mm -hmm. What are the issues you want to connect the dots to in this conversation on World Disability Day? Um, thank you for having me. Um, so, so first, I'm, I must say, I'm just listening to, her, to everyone speak. And, um, and I must agree that when you talk about inclusion, I'm, I'm more than just a mental health therapist. I've been doing work um, with, with all types of disabilities, individuals with all types of disabilities for more than 25 years being here. And so, I'm a unique therapist because not many people, not many individuals who work with um, in the mental health field do what I do. So I specialize with individuals, um, working with individuals with autism and Asperger's. And so um, years ago when I lived in Jamaica as a child, I look at what's the difference. I questioned as a child, what's the difference between a child with a disability and a child without a disability. And I got my answer when I came here. There's no difference. And so that's what would, would shift um, from us being not the individuals with disability not being included to being included. There is no difference. There has to be a cultural shift mm -hmm. for individuals, government, um, or, or uh, providers to understand that there is no difference. Someone with a disability can achieve in their own rights the things that we are doing. So they can do the same things. They may be able to do it in a different way, but they can achieve just the same life that we are living today. And that's what it will take for inclusion to, to come about. Yes, it's going to be difficult as I understand in Jamaica. I was born in Jamaica and there has to be a cultural shift in how government thinks. As a therapist, um, there's not too many, uh, as I said, um, therapists who, who, who know how to work with individuals. So um, that, that, that um, needs to change so that we're able to support individuals, you know, uh, as well as the family member when they come in. There has to be respect and dignity for one person-centered approach. It's not a one size that fits all. Um, and, and that's what um, I'm hearing across the board mm -hmm. um, as, as we're all speaking um, mm -hmm. about being included. Mm -hmm. None of us want to be excluded from, from, um, from the world, from our communities, from our school, from an environment. And so, um, COVID has taught us that we are right now, um, when we had to be quarantined, we were excluded and that did not feel well to anyone. That's what being excluded feels like when we were quarantined, we had to stay home. And that's how a person with a disability feels every single day to be excluded. And, and so if we can look at COVID, what COVID has, has taught us is that there are what it feels like, but th that there are also possibilities. Because we had to live in a virtual world, it took away a lot of the impossibilities and, may have, and have made things more possible. As a therapist, I, I work with families from a different standpoint. I, I work with them to understand what does it feel like for you to get up every day and to do what you're doing day in and day out. So, um, I believe if we look at that from a provider standpoint, we're able to get to where we need to be and to be included. I'm, 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 I'm just pausing because I'm choosing, 
I'm choosing something in the moment. Um, I saw Maureen Weber's, her daughter's comment about feeling, you know, that we are all excluded. I, I wanted, I, I've, I don't know that I've said this to Christine, but um, last year I did a personality, one of those personality tests. And I'm saying this to respond to what Lorraine Smith just said, because sometimes, you know, <laughs> As Maureen is saying, it's not a homogenous group. There are levels of disability, which it's easy to include. There are levels of disability, which can even operate at a level of proficiency and excellence. So I've, I've never said this in this kind of an environment, but my test showed that I had touched levels of autism but it was on the level of brilliance, not, not autism on the level of it being a disability, but on the other side, counterbalancing side, um, Lorraine, I was um, showing signs of having Asperger's. Right. Okay, so here I am facilitating and presenting how I have lived with very high levels of anxiety for most of my life. Um, I use it to feed excellence and to learn how to control those responses in order to bring that centeredness to my presentation skills. So when we're talking about disabilities, it is a very wide range of experiences. And so as we seek to, you know, deal with the matters of inclusion and deal with the matter of preparing a world that has people be able to participate, people with presenting disabilities that are visible are always, they are definitely ostracized. Absolutely. So and Elaine, may... Elaine, so if I can just kind of jump in here and just Please. invite center back into the conversation. I just need to turn know, off my alarm. Yes, I know other, um, other panelists haven't spoken yet, but center. So we have done some significant work um, together over the years. And one of the perspective you shared with me really helped to shift my eyes that when we say, you know, that not everybody can get a job or not, that, that is not the truth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I remember you told me about that young man coming, Lorraine. No, not, not, I'm not, I'm just expanding the conversation because some other things are happening in the chat. So I remember that young man, Christopher, who you said when you were in the classroom. And could you just share that? Because that was one of the moments that took me to a place of, really beginning to look beyond a lot of the what's and the disability and to really begin to see, you know, what is possible from that story. Can you share, share, share that experience again? Sure, I'll try to be as uh, concise as I can. Um, there was a, a, young, a young boy that I was working with that uh, was diagnosed with cerebral palsy, spastic aphetoid quadriplegia. So that means all four of his limbs were affected where he had either limited or very spastic movement that he mm -hmm. could not control. And uh, the first time I met him, his mother willed him into the room and she said, uh, I want you to spend some time, get to know my son. And the first thing that I want you to continue to work with him on is um, him moving to write his last name. And she said, he already knows how to, how to spell his first name. And again, spastic quadriplegia, hands are fisted, held closely tight to the chest, very limited movement. The only way this young man could communicate was either through head nods like this, which meant yes, head down like this, which meant no, or blinking his eyes. That was it. And so when the mother shared with me that he knows how to spell his name, I'm thinking, how, how? And she looked at me and she said, you figure that out. And she built <laughs> right into the room. <laughs> And what's so powerful about the story is that I sat down and I looked eye to eye with this young man and knowing that just because he was limited by his physical capacity, 
my job and responsibility was to figure out mentally, affectionately, emotionally, where was he? And so I sat down, I looked at him and I said, Christopher, your mother said, you know how to spell your name. His hands fisted like this, his head went back like this, which meant to me, yes. Mm -hmm. So I thought I would be smart and go, okay. <laughs> I put an S on the paper. His hands became even more drawn into his body. He put a grimace on his face. His head went down like this. And I could tell that was a no. Mm -hmm. So I erased the S and I put a C. His head went back. A smile came across his face. And I was like, okay. And to this day, it gives me chills just to tell this story. We went through every single letter. Christopher is not a short name. That is a long name. And I kept playing with the letters. So I would make a C and then I would make a O and he would get fisted. He would draw his head back or he would draw it forward. And he was communicating to me. And as clearly as I'm talking to you right now in this moment, this young man demonstrated to me that he had the capacity to spell his name. Mm -hmm. So. Christine and I uh, reflect on that story because we did a lot of work in Jamaica and working with businesses and doing business breakfasts. And Elaine, I'm sure you can remember back mm -hmm. in that time where it was opening the hearts and minds of businesses to understand there are things that children and persons with disabilities can contribute to society. We just haven't thought about it. So if, if you have a movie theater, who are the people that are taking the tickets at the movie theater? That is a life skill, that is an opportunity to connect, that is giving someone an opportunity to quote unquote have a job, but to show up and be in society. Maybe they don't have words, but they have the movement to accept a ticket, or they have the movement to smile at a person, or they have the voice to be able to say hello as a greeter. Sometimes we have to shift our thinking about how we're seeing life and seeing the world. And then I wanna circle back on something that Lorraine was sharing and Elaine um, was stating and Maureen, you were tapping on that I think is really important to the conversation now. One of my um, works is that I am in the process of constantly interrupting, dismantling and giving people new eyes and viewpoints to see the world, especially children with disabilities. In America, I'm very clear, as long as we have two systems, a special education system and a general education system, we will never know what inclusion looks like. Right. Because we will continue to run the categories to indicate the separateness of this population versus this population. And that doesn't mean that you get rid of supports and services, but opposed to having this system and this system, and you're still trying to figure out why can't we just look at children as whole bodies well, you continue to fragment them and put them in pockets of system. So until that changes and we develop a deeper understanding, that's always gonna be an issue. And I share it with Christine, when systems don't exist, that's when we should get excited. Mm -hmm. That's when we should get invigorated because it doesn't exist. That means we can create it. Mm -hmm. And there are other countries that have gone before us in, the, in, in other parts of the world that have been able to do this. And so we don't have to do our own mistakes. We can right. look across the sea and we could say, I can learn from this and we can put our systems in place. So I don't want people, I always wanna deal with the truth. I always wanna deal with authenticity. I always wanna deal with the real stories, but I also always want to deal with what Elaine charged us with at the beginning when I came on was not only the challenges, but how can we move the needle to create celebrations and innovation? And we all have the capacity to do that. I couldn't do this work in the United States. We have systems in place because parents like you stepped forward and said, not my child. Right. I want more for my son. I want more for my daughter. And they totally changed our system. We wouldn't have inclusion. We wouldn't have special education. We wouldn't have laws if parents didn't rise up and say, I want and I demand more. I don't know how to do it but my heart will guide me. And because this sister, this brother, this mother, this father are joining me, 
we're creating the charge and we're creating change. And, and I'm, I'm a living person. Lorraine, I'm looking at you. You have San Francisco behind you. You must be <laughs> in the United States right now, but your heart is in Jamaica. I, I can Absolutely. hear that and I can see that. I just mm -hmm. want to um, be real about the conversation and be honest and, and raise our eyes just a little bit more and saying, Maureen, I, I hear you. And I hear all the things that you are communicating about your life and your experience. I hear it and I understand it and I don't disregard it. I wanna uplift it and say, given that story, how do we create a promise as people in positions of quote unquote power to create change? I'm sorry, I, I, think, I'm, I, think, I think whatever I said, I'm sorry to interrupt, might have given you, a, given you a sense of my fear of giving up or that I feel hopeless or I feel trodden upon. First of all, as Dr. Lyra will tell you, I consider being a parent of Brian to be an honor. Yes. I consider being his parent to be a, a joyous event. It has, it has made me a better person. I feel a little guilty sometimes because I think I'm better off than he is, right? So I don't want, to, I don't want you to think for a moment that I'm some sort of a poor but don't tell him parent who is tired. Because if I was tired, then Brian would be in trouble. He's 28 years old. And you see, I, I put him on the table and I say that, I was chosen to be his parent and God chose him because of a reason. Brian has very, very limited cognitive skills. So it's not as if to say he can nod up and down, no. He stims and I've had to master and listen in myself to hear the different stimming, the pitches of the stimming tells me if it's a happy stimming, if it's a content, if it's a fair stim. I've mastered those different things. But because he does not communicate traditional ways, I have learned to listen to everyone. So I have gotten a talent from him that I would not normally have had, right? I guess I wanted to communicate that sometimes we talk about the disability and we think about all the things that can be fixed. But there is that 2%, which is where Brian and I sit, where the challenge sometimes becomes so incredibly overwhelming. I wanted to come in on these three, on these three sessions. I mean, I don't want to come in on Thursday evening. I got up on Monday and, and, and um, yesterday morning, Dave was a Brian couldn't stand up. He couldn't stand on his own feet. No matter what we did, Masin daughter and I, and he has arthritis. I had to hold him up, but they lift him, put him on the toilet, everything. So we could not, I couldn't join. And I really wanted to hear and to listen and to learn. Okay. So I don't want you to think I've come on position of I'm tired or I've given up or anything like that. And I don't think it is, it is when you have limited cognitive skills, it's not about the other things. He just cannot process the spoken word. He can process your soul. Thank yeah. God. He you knows if you're a piece of crap, he will walk you out the door, put you to the door. You walk into his space and you don't, he don't like you and you don't like him, he says that door is yours, right? Mm -hmm. But but it is something I think one of the things that we don't have in our space is the kind of parent understanding. Mm -hmm. um, not a sympathy or empathy, but an understanding. And so when we speak about how we feel, people are saying, you're not trying hard enough. You're advocating hard enough. It's sometimes people really get tired. Uh -oh. Yes, of course. Of course, um, getting tired is, is, Elaine, is too much. Elaine, yes. if I could just take, just take 10 seconds and then we can move on because I want to be so incredibly clear with my words. Yes. What I'm hearing is not about woes me. That's what we say in, in, in US, woes me. Like I'm tired, I'm complaining. I'm not hearing that. What I'm hearing are real authentic stories that are grounded in, your, in everyone's reality. I, I, I don't refute that because that's your experience. That's not what I'm saying at all. We need the real stories. That's why we ask the question, what hurts your heart, what breaks your back, and what keeps you up at night? Because those are the real stories. So I never, I don't know you, Maureen, I'm getting to know you by this space. I trust because of the women that you travel with. If you're traveling with Christine, I already know a little something about you. I know you can't be that soft. You can't be, because this is a woman who's a warrior. So I, I know who her tribal folks are, but I just want you to know, this is more about share your story the way that you have shared it. And all I'm saying is how can we lift one another up with the realities and the truth that we live? and try to find the strategy so that tomorrow when we wake, we are more enriched than what we were when we went to bed the night before. That's all I'm saying. Amen. All yeah. good. All good. Mm -hmm. So I want to bring in someone. Thank you so much, ladies. I am touched, moved, and inspired. And I am just grateful for all of it because all is the truth. 
all is necessary. Elaine, can I jump right in before yes. the next? So, um, Dwayne Donor says it is possible to push policy through the international human rights as it pertains to special needs. Is it possible considering that countries have not the systems in place? And my answer to that is yes. And by my book, it will explain. But um, Liana says, well, um, Liana says, I'm greatly benefiting from my time here. And she has been present for the last couple of days. And so we want to thank um, our participants for really sharing and really engaging. And the fact that you have come to this space mean that you're at the place when you may have decided that enough of what is, is enough. And exactly. It's time for change. Yeah. And so we really honor you and thank you. Leonor said in inclusion can start also at home. In fact, it should. We must teach our children to include everyone because the change starts at home. Thank you, Lenore. Well, I, I, I am inspired and I'm learning something. And I now know that for one thing I've got is, hey, people need bank accounts. So is there a process by which we can together look at what are the strategies that need to occur in order for the banking sector or whichever sector it is? And does it always have to go through the government or is it that we need to design the strategies because yeah. people want to practice corporate social responsibility. And so there are ways and means for us to provide the necessary information which increases the social consciousness in those spaces. But I wanted should, to bring in Sasha, who has been very, very present as uh, um, a parent to a child with disability as well, and a member of our Nathan e. Banks Foundation. Sasha, in the midst of all of this, what's occurring for you? Um, hello, everyone. I have been listening keenly, and I'm gathering from everybody. And what I'm putting together is that we can't do it alone. We can't do it alone. We have to do it as a body. We have to come together as individuals. And I was listening to Maureen and I heard your story. I have a similar experience. You know, our stories may be different in some ways, but the challenges that we have can be similar. And I'm tying in everybody's statements to say this, that when I met up with Christine as a mother of a child with a disability, I was frustrated. I was miserable. I was at my wit's end. Mm -hmm. And finding that support in someone else who had been there, who had done that and could guide me. But I listened to Senta and I'm pulling from her where she said the mindset I understand that my mind had to be in a certain place to receive Christine's heart. And in order for me to receive Christine's heart, to go forth and change my mindset in order to look at things differently, to see things differently and say, hey, there are so many persons out there like me. How can I change this? How can I as an individual change this? Not just for my child, but for all of those children out there. And I don't remember, somebody else had said something about um, seeing the children. I think it was Lorraine who said something about seeing all children as equal. Seeing all children as not this one who has a disability and that one who is quote unquote normal, but their children first before having an issue or a disability. And I remember when I met Senta in 2015, and I was exposed to, you know, the whole curriculum and full circle. And what grabbed my attention was her, I think it was your motto, Senta, and if I'm not stating it correctly, you can, you can guide me. To touch the heart of a child is to touch the soul of a nation. That grabbed my attention. And that is what I'm bringing out today, because today, if we want to touch these children, we have to come together as a nation, as a people, bringing inclusion, not just from the perspective of policy, not just from the perspective of what the government says, 
But what we say, because every system has to be created in a different way for each child, because each child will receive it in a different way. And we must understand that, as um, I think it was Maureen who said, it's not a one cap that fits everybody. It's not a one chart that's going to fit everybody. There are different systems that has to be created. And that's basically my experience and what I've gathered from everybody. And this summit is something that has pulled a lot of us together to bring out the knowledge and understanding that we've gathered so far. And I say that to say this, that when I met Christine, it inspired me to form a super parent support group for parents like myself to really guide them and help them along the way to say, hey, you're not alone. Because trust me, being alone and having to deal with it on your own, that's where the frustration comes in. That's where the depression comes in. And that's when you feel like nothing is working and nobody is there to help you. So that's my two cents. And I, sh I should just add in that um, uh, Sasha didn't stay there in just forming the super parent group. Yes. Um, to, to bring in support. And when you watch the activity going on in the group, just being in that community with each other and lift other parents. And I think, Maureen, that for many of our parents, they are doing it alone and it is impossible. Um, it really does take a village and a part of, for, for me, and, and, and we dealt with this on Monday in terms of um, our personal self-leadership. You know, what are we choosing? To be responsible and accountable for so i made a choice and you have as well so it is not a trading off of a store but i'm just saying that i had to make a choice about how i was going to how i was choosing to be with my son and to be around my son and how was i choosing to move forward and sometimes it's tested sometimes it's challenged i spoke earlier in the week about um because you know, Nathan, he does have his challenge like any, any, any other child, but then there are some others. And I shared in the week that I got to that place of just not knowing what to do, even just recently. And just having Sasha talk about that support, just having that support of somebody who understand the area that I was dealing with, who understands that, you know, you need to step back from the behavior and understand what is communicating and let me support you through this. Um, really walk me through that. So one of the messages that we're asking parents to do on this summit is there has been a lot of conversation going. People are getting to know people. There are 18 countries where participants are from. And we're saying identify one or two person whom you've been talking with. You have your workbook. There is a section in the workbook for network. Build your network. Um, Sento, when she did her keynote along with Dr. Kathleen Van Antwerp, they talk about the five protective factors. So what we're focused on is giving parents some tools that can support them to continue in the journey while very importantly teaching them how, how important it is to tell their stories and how important it is for them to raise their voice because we do have a right. Maureen, you know that it takes 1,000 signatures in Jamaica to change something in the law. How many parents know that? And when you ask them, how many parents will even sign? And so we just want to get people into a place of recognizing that there is more power in us um, that we believe you push and you get things done for your son. I push and get things done for my son. And so we're saying if more of us are pushing against the system like they have, parents have done in other jurisdictions, the system has to change. I'm allowing the pause, seeing who is jumping in. Okay. I, who is I sinking? I saw Dr. Lybird moving as if he was coming into the conversation. Am I reading you right, sir? Yes, yes. I, okay. I, I'm seeing my microphone is muted. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, I, I posted in the chat there that there's a process of change which we all must understand how to change the system or create something new from yeah. nothing. And once we understand that process, it can be replicated over and over and over again. So having a vision where we want to get, where we are at, and then you bridge the gap. And that has been well described in the literature. And then we begin to look at what we need 
who we need to go on with us, find people of like mind, and little by little we will get there. A thousand miles begin with one step. And so, but we keep focused on the long-term goal. We have short, intermediate goal along the way so that we chart our progress. And to, to, to give you my story, as a, as a an anesthesia is coming back to Nevis, the only anesthetist here for 25 years, I was alone, but now we have two of us, we have three new anesthetists, and I could walk away from the theater without being concerned that people will suffer because I have, over the last 25 years, built a system, I have taken up my ground and said, I'm not going to walk myself into the ground. I need to have downtime. I need to be able to go and take a vacation and the system is secure. The other time when I couldn't leave because there was no one to cover my cover my duties. But now the government have another initiative. They have nothing, nothing been done. So I could stay back and let the work go on without me. And that's the way we have to make ourselves redundant so that the system could function with or without us. I don't know if my son will take care of him making myself, making, making me redundant of him, but I get your point. <laughs> Yeah, but can I also just add something? Because the word system keeps coming up a lot. And um, Senator, that's something that you taught me, um, you know, about the fact. And, and Dr. Leiber, you have said that. Um, I had to come to a place of recognizing that systems take time to change. So, and that there, there, there are various things that we're working at. We're working at systems, we're working at practice, we're working at procedures. And so not all of them take the same time frame. And I remember um, Dr. Faye Brown from Yale Child Development um, Study at Yale University said to me one day that the work that you're doing, um, Christine, you probably will see the results in your generation because systems take time to change, but the groundwork has to be laid. And so, um, Senta, I know that a lot of the work that you do looks at systems change. So could you just, um, you know, give us a little insight in that area? Sure. Okay, um, one minute, please, before we go on. That. Can I get, jump with you one minute, please? Sure. sure. Uh, when I was in medical school, I know I was coming back to Nevis. In 1970, there was no doctors on the island. Before you both went down and about 20 people lost their life, right? And I put myself that when I finish my training, I will come back home and serve my people. Nothing to do with the money. I could have stayed in Jamaica. I could have stayed in the UK. I could have gone to the US and practiced there, but I choose to come back here to help build a system so that in my lifetime, we could have a sustainable healthcare system. And I choose to do anesthesia because surgeons will come, they will spend a week or two, and they will leave. All they could do is lumps and bumps and hernias on the local anesthesia. They couldn't do any major surgery. They couldn't anything cesarean section. Had to go to St. Kitts. And I said, no, that's not my island where you want to retire and, and, and live in. So I made my duty to do anesthesia because a surgeon can't work without anesthesia. They need good anesthesia care. And now we have an island Three, three of OBGYN, two general surgeon, an orthopedic surgeon, all working on this small island, 36 square miles, 14,000 people. We have wow. two pediatricians, and that's in the last 25 years. That, so what, because so what made, you're saying, people. yes, what you're saying, Dr. Lybert, is that it takes one person standing in the gap and exactly. being committed and making a declaration and standing in the declaration, regardless of what appearances occur, but holding to that. So yeah. we thank you for sharing that because I just saw that picture so clearly. And when you're standing, one can get tired and hopeless and cynical. But the truth is when you stand and shine that light, that you are not called to know where the support will necessarily come from, but to know that it must come. So I want to go to, to, to center to say, how can we have a sense of assurance about systems changing? But may I for, for add? No, no, I want to go, to... I want to know Dr. Library. I want her to answer and then yes. I can come back to you. Okay. Because okay, sorry, this, no yes, thank you. 
So I will begin by saying that when we talk about systems change, there are three elements that we all need to keep in mind. So whomever's listening to this now or on a delayed recording, there are three ways to look at systems. There's systems thinking, there's systems development, and there's systems change. And systems thinking is this understanding that Elaine, you just shared, is that you could have one person to stand in the gap and to create the declaration like doctor has shared and understanding that that one person can have a ripple effect on everything within a system. So it could take one, just like when you cast a rock into, an, uh, into a river or an ocean, there was one pebble that created a ripple effect. So the systems thinking is that how, how do we think about what's currently going on with principles, policies, and practices? What's current, how do we think about that? And Christine, you were saying earlier that sometimes as parents, we don't think from that place, mm -hmm. but yet we operate from that place on a daily basis because as parents, our, our family is a system. It is an interrelated uh, opportunity or experience of individual people that are creating change reactions within one another and that each one plays a role. So there's the thinking part, systems thinking, once we start thinking in principles, policies, and practices, my principle is I'm standing in the gap. I refuse to be moved. I refuse to be denied. I want people to hear my voice. Maureen talked about, no, you're not only gonna treat my child, but I want you to treat all the children that come after my child or stand right next to my child. That's the declaration. That's a principle that you stand behind. The policy is now, how are you going to make that happen? I wanna see it written down. Show me in writing what this is gonna look like. That's the policy. The practice is you might have the heart standing in the gap, you might have the written words, but the question is, will you now practice the things that you have said? So principles, policies, and practices are central to how we think about the systems that control or contribute to our lives. The development is now that we've thought about it, how do we develop the systems that we want to see or develop the changes that we want to see made? So I, I'm hoping that that, um, give some insight into whenever you hear the word systems and why we use the word systems to understand what it really means that there's um principles policies and practices that drive systems and systems are not things they're made up of people we're the ones who actually operate and create those systems so if we can get in a place of systems thinking systems development systems change, then that's when we start really designing the future that we envision for our children or for our families. But those things are critical. And sometimes we only look at what's directly in front of us opposed to lifting our eyes to the situation and being able to take a God's eye view or a bird's eye view to be able to see how all things are working in tandem to create what we're seeing directly in front of us. Hope that wasn't confusing. But no, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad you shared that because um, one of the things um, that that I shared, Santa, and I, I I haven't shared it in this forum yet, but I share it often, was in the early days because um, Santa started coming to Jamaica from 2008, uh, Maureen, and she sat in our classrooms and her eyes were like saucer when she saw the practices of you know what was what you know what was going on and so on. And I, I, initially I thought I'd scared her off and that, you know, she wouldn't have come back. But when she was so excited, and so when I was seeing this not happening, that not happening, no laws in place, no law, the same conversation she just had was what put me in a different place. Because she said, in the United States, we have the laws, we have a lot of those things in place, but children are still being excluded from services. Children still are not getting what they need. Children still need. So, uh, but the laws sometimes make it difficult. She said in Jamaica, and by extension, I'm now saying the Caribbean where the laws are not yet in place, you get to pull from the experience of other countries like the United States and to now create the laws that are more focused on serving your children. And that excited me. And that is why um, it never ends. No, it never ends. It's a continuous job. But we do, just as though 
Um, Jamaica is at a place now where we are, um, we have had the law that has been passed, but not yet enacted. That document took 15 years and many of the people who started that have died. But do we stop? No, we continue because it is important that we build on the work. Miss Nihaya. Yes. Go ahead, Maureen. Okay, I just...